Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. We are back with our resident uranium expert, Justin Hewn of Uranium Insider. Justin, thank you for coming back on the show. Always a pleasure. How are you doing, Steve? Excellent. Excellent. I'm, uh, you saw I'm dressing for success here. I'm super excited about this one. We got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, yeah, just excited about uranium as always. I see that. I, I feel underdressed. Uh, should you want to give me a second to go throw on a blazer or something? Yeah, <laughs> get on a tie. <laughs> we'll get you a corset. <laughs> <laughs> I need it. <laughs> All right. We, uh, judging by the questions that I've gotten, the emails that I've gotten in the last month or so, we have a lot of new, uh, listeners and viewers and I think investors into the uranium space. And I can completely relate to that. Two and a half years ago, my brother told me about uranium. I researched it. I didn't, to be honest, I didn't really understand it. We don't buy things we don't understand. And then it moved about 40%. And I'm like, Maybe the kid knows what he's talking about. That's when I found you, and we are so grateful that we did because now we're in this investment. And, uh, um, and maybe you could just take a, uh, you know, a couple minutes for the the new investors into this space and and just kind of give the macro picture of the supply demand and why we would believe that this is uh, such a great investment. Sure, I like that uh, thirty thousand foot view from from where we are now. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I found this sector in 2016 within a month or two of the actual bottom for U308, which was just under 18 bucks a pound. Um, you know, at the time it was a super contrarian investment. No, nobody wanted to hear anything about uranium or nuclear. Yeah. Nuclear was dead. Um, the overall assumption was nuclear would never be a growth sector. Uh, it was completely dead in the United States. It was largely dead in the rest of the world. Uh, Germany was shutting off their reactors. Japan still had barely restarted any reactors. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, the price was still so low that MacArthur River went into care and maintenance. Uh, Rabbit Lake was closed. Uh, Paladin's Langer Heinrich went into care and maintenance. The sector was left for dead. And that, of course, was extremely compelling from a contrarian setup for myself and, and a small handful of other investors that saw the early opportunity. And what has happened since then nobody would have ever guessed would have happened. Um, I mean, you can, if you actually modeled out the numbers going back then, you could actually see that there was a projected small growth, uh, you know, compound annual growth rate for the sector going forward from, from even the bottom 2016, 17, 18, you know, one or 2% per year. And what has actually happened is basically like a full on nuclear renaissance. It's been a, a, a confluence of factors, which is the concerns about quote unquote climate and carbon emissions, concerns about uh, baseload green energy, and then security of, of energy, which has been highlighted over the past couple of years, especially with uh, the situation in Ukraine. And all of these factors have come together to, to basically point towards a substantially larger compound annual growth rate for the sector. So we went from maybe one or 2% a year to now what, what even the IEA and the IAEA are projecting you know, it could be a three or four up to five or 6% per year growth in the sector. Compounding, that's an incredible rate of growth. And all of that has happened on the backdrop of a recovering uranium price. So the price has gone very clearly from $18 a pound to all, just about $70 a pound here. We've had a number of fits and starts, but for the most part, it's been two steps forward, one step back, higher, high, higher, low sort of kind of price movement, very clear upward price trend for the commodity. Now what we're seeing here is a substantial growth in the sector, a, a significantly growing annual demand picture that not, that not only has to do with the sector growing, but it has to do with life extensions, has to do with plant restarts. We're actually seeing that. And it also has to do with um, insufficient Western enrichment capacity. So the actual amount of uranium purchased to, to, supply the same, let's say, overall gigawatt capacity for nuclear is higher because enrichment tails assays are higher. So all of that points to very large supply deficits. So this year alone, we're talking about 40 to 50 million pounds um, insufficient supply that will have to be filled by increased contracting, increased spot market purchasing and inventory drawing down. 
And we're seeing all of those things happening. So while we're not now, while this isn't a super contrarian, you know, top of the first inning type investment any longer, it's very de-risked from uh, the place where we're at uh, just a few years ago. So now it's the the growth of the sector is is pretty obvious. Um, the demand for the sector is very stable and growing. It's very relatively easy to model out the actual demand for global nuclear reactors and what reactors are expected to shut down and which ones are expected to come online and project that out a few years. Um, the tricky part happens with the tails assay assumptions and what that means for overall uranium demand, but a very robust demand picture and a supply picture that is... Uh, fragile to put it in a single word and it's going to take higher prices in multiple years for that to balance out if it gets balanced out and there's still plenty of skepticism amongst the industry and the investment community of whether or not this market will be able to balance itself out okay yeah so basically uh we're consuming as a planet across our 430 something uh, nuclear power plants we're consuming about 200 million pounds a year we're only pulling out of the ground and supplying uh, 150 to 160, we'll say. So there's 40 to 50 million pounds of uh, deficit there, right? And um, just to give uh, you know new guys into the into the sector a, a, a kind of an, an idea of how small this market is, um, at 200 million pounds a year, at 70 bucks a pound, that works out to about 14 billion dollars worth of uranium uh, consumption every year. Uh, now, if you just take Apple, the, the phone company, Apple, their, their cash position right now is about 170 million pounds. So Apple's cash position alone, not what the company's worth, but just their cash that they have sitting in the bank or treasuries or whatever they got, they could buy 12 years supply <laughs> of uranium with just their cash position. So you're getting into a market that is very niche, very small. It is one one thousandth of the market cap of the S&P 500, okay? So it's a very small market, it's very volatile, but the overall trend is generally up. Does that summarize it pretty well? Yeah, that's great. I, I never I never would have thought of, uh, of taking a relative, like almost like a relative valuation picture of, of Apple cash versus you know supply demand deficit. That's really interesting. Um, but yeah, no, I think you nailed it. And to add some color to people that are just, you know, that are new, listeners to your channel or or new to this investment thesis, uranium acts very different from most other commodities, from all other commodities, really. It's the only feedstock for the nuclear power plants that are operating currently in, in the world. Yes, there's other designs that could be built that operate, that can operate on thorium, et cetera. But as of now, all of the operating reactors in the world have to feed uranium into their, into their processes. So basically, given that nuclear power plants are very large, very expensive, very strategically important physical assets, you can't not fuel that reactor. So if you're a fuel buyer for a nuclear utility and the price of uranium goes from $25 to $75, you have to buy it. It's not that you can just not buy it because the price went up. And that that is really, really unique in terms of commodities. Because I get the question a lot about, okay, well, we, we're in a recession or we will be in a recession very shortly here, which is pretty much 100% consensus, unanimous at this point. Um, how does that affect uranium? It doesn't really. I mean, the nuclear reactors typically are a um, minority percentage of any given grid. They're baseload. And they don't really see much effect from a recession. Yes, is there a small amount of electricity demand that gets hit in a recession? Sure. Will they cycle down that electricity production 5 or 10%? Maybe. What does that mean in terms of the buying of uranium that they have to do? Because they have to buy uranium now for their processes three, four, five, six years from now. So a recession that lasts from December 2023 until June of 2024 or whatever, you know, I'm just pontificating here. That that means absolutely nothing in terms of a contracting cycle for a nuclear utility. So, and it's also a very small percentage of their overall budget. You know, three to 5% of the operating budget is actually uranium feedstock. Uh, so they have to buy it even if the price goes higher and the price is going to go higher. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now <clears throat> one question from Eric. He's basically asking about uh, principal risks. Uh, so the the primary principal risk that everyone can see is is another uh, Fukushima or um, uh, Chernobyl 
uh, which wouldn't happen now because we've learned from that and we've right. essentially, uh, you know, made sure that that's not going to happen again. W what are some other principal risks that, that you could see? I mean, the biggest risk to the investment, I would say, is not... I mean, yes, aside from a nuclear accident, which is, it's always possible. You're correct that another Chernobyl is not going to happen because there isn't a reactor like Chernobyl currently in operation that's lacking a containment field or containment dome around the, around the core. So that physically can't happen again. But, you know, you never know if there's some sort of nuclear accident that, that even if it doesn't affect the local area or, or the plans for whoever's operating nuclear um, it could affect sentiment in the short term and affect the equities, 100%. Uh, but with that aside, what is the biggest, I mean, what's the question really? What's the bear thesis? Yeah. I mean, the, the bear thesis, I would I would say, is an unforeseen demand hit. So so a hit to demand that that is unexpected. So that could potentially be something like, you know, if China all of a sudden reversed course, and said, just kidding, our nuclear plans of hitting 150 gigawatts by 2030, we're now going to try to hit 100 gigawatts by 2040. All right, so that's going to significantly slow down their construction plans. That would affect the demand picture somewhat, although you would still see higher uranium prices based on the existing fleet and the contracting that needs to happen for existing reactors. So, but so that's something, um, you know, it's unexpected shutdowns would be a bearish case as of now the evidence for that or the evidence of what i just mentioned the china is the exact opposite we're seeing we're literally seeing pretty much only one country which is germany shut down perfectly good nuclear reactors uh belgium shut down a couple of reactors last year but since then they have shifted and are seeking life extensions for their remaining two reactors Sweden shut down a perfectly good reactor two years ago. They have since then elected into a kind of a conservative leaning government that is doing a 180 on nuclear and wanting to actually expand nuclear in Sweden. And most other countries are looking at life extensions for their existing reactors and starting to recognize the value of those. So, but, you know, I think, I think the most, the most cogent bear case really would be countries not doing the right thing. You know, so, and that's, that makes the most sense to me as well, because it's Political really risk. obvious. It's really, yeah, it's yeah. really obvious to say, okay, well, nuclear react, nuclear is, is the answer to so many of, of the world's problems here in terms of just the energy return on investment, um, clean energy, cheap baseload energy in most places, but countries don't always do what is right. And Germany is a clear example of that. And there's plenty of other examples in different areas of study besides nuclear where, um, you know, the governmental leadership just continues to screw the pooch and shoot itself in the foot. I mean, a, a pretty much across the board, uh, just completely inept government leadership. I'm, I'm not going to get too much on a soapbox here, but uh, certainly seeing a shift away from this current trend in nuclear would be bearish. Um, I don't really see a supply side bearish story in that, you know, I don't see an unexpected supply windfall happening, at least not in the short to the midterm, you know, because Adam Prom announced a couple of weeks back that they plan to uh, take, well, they planned, they, they announced this a while back where they plan to take 2025 production to 10% below their subsoil use contracts, um, which the last few years and this year included have been 20% below, which is about 23,000 tons a year or just under 60 million pounds. Um, that's going to rise a little bit next year, possibly. But they're looking at 2026. They're, they're saying they want to get to between 30 and a half and 31 and a half thousand tons, which is 80 million pounds of uranium. And uh, that's not going to happen. So, and we can talk about that more. I, I know you, there's a bunch of questions that came in about Kazadam Prom, but I don't really see where the supply is going to come from. You know, there's a number of projects. Brazil has a phosphate project with a uranium sort of uh, a bonus that might be producing some uranium 2026. The French are developing ISR in Mongolia, which is late decade, maybe 2030 first production. The ramping in, in Kazakhstan, we can talk about that more, um, why I see that as being problematic. They will increase production somewhat, but it's not even going to touch the, the supply deficit. Uh, problem, uh, there's still a coup in Niger, and the, the Greenfield Project the Global Atomics DASA has been delayed because of that. Um, I mean, even the, the even the existing mines in Saskatchewan 
Cameco and Arano's joint venture at MacArthur River and Cigar Lake. These mines have been in operation for more than a decade. They have hundreds of uh, employed skilled, uh, skilled staff. They're not hitting their production targets for existing mines. So investors should have an incredible amount of skepticism in terms of supply coming online on time, on budget, and, and at the production levels that, that they're aiming for. So there's no supply windfall in the in the short to the near uh, in, in, in I would say in the near to the midterm. It's really difficult. I you know Steve I I always try to poke holes in my in my bearish outlook or excuse me uh, bullish outlook for the sector, but even outside of my own hole poking, I can't find a solid bear thesis. I've never seen a very well researched bear thesis. I just haven't seen it in five, six years following this sector, seven years following the sector, I've never once seen a well-researched bearish take on the sector. It's always just some uh, tweet and, and mining Twitter or min twit. There's some very, very sharp mining analyst, mining investment analysts on Twitter that just don't get this. They don't get this at all. And their bearish takes are so shallow. They're they're utterly shallow. And so I've yet to see it. I would love to see a, a better case be made for either a supply windfall or, or a doubts about um, demand, but haven't seen it. And I can't figure it out either. So I'm I'm pretty confident that we're heading higher. Yeah. The one the, the biggest one I keep coming back to is uh our big thinkers deciding that nuclear is bad for the environment and coal is good. And that, that, that's pretty much the best part, which is not out of the out of the woods, I guess. Just look at Germany. But uh, OK, so um, uh, could you bring up uh, the chart of just URNM uh, and uh, uh, share your screen with that? And we got four questions that are kind of all um, uh, similar and uh, basically Okay, so we could see the run up here that we've had. This is a, for the the new investors. This is if if I could only place one bet on uranium, it would be in this ETF. This is an ETF that has uh, a lot uh, two of the biggest miners on the planet. It's got physical uranium in it, and then it has a whole bunch of uh, uh, developers and and explorers. And you can see the run up that we've had here in the last couple of months, which is probably what put it on your radar. And so basically what the next few questions are asking uh, 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 Eduardo, Nolan, um, Steve, and Elder Catch um, is, is describing that run up. And, uh, you know, do, do you think uh, it's got more to run or have we kind of petered out here? Well, I think the stock's pretty clearly got overbought in the short term. And uh, the market was looking for an excuse to see a little bit of profit taking in a correction. That excuse was the news from Kazatapong that they would be ramping their production. So um, my message to our membership when that news release came out was um, take advantage of it. This is basically a FUD move uh, and some, and some short-term profit taking. So, I mean, it's been a big run, right? I mean, yeah. off of the, off of the lows kind of May, June into kind of moving sideways. So we'll just say the breakout is kind of here. You know, we ran up almost 40%. Now we've seen a 15% pullback ish somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, so it's ten percent, twelve percent off off the high print. I mean, it's not much of a pullback. If you go and look at historically speaking, like the pullbacks on the on the runs for for the stocks in the previous bull market, we had multiple thirty to fifty percent pullbacks over the course of three or four years uh, during that massive leg up. So this is totally healthy, technically, fundamentally. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're going to see profit taking along the way. <laughs> you, you, nothing goes up in a straight line. Nothing goes down in a straight line. So uh, I, I, I just find it interesting every time uranium pulls back at all, it, there's like all this pressure to be some kind of like correction apologist. It's like, no, it's just the markets. I mean, there are traders. Traders exist in every market. Not everybody is going to buy and hold you know, people are going to take short-term profits and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So as far as I can tell, most of these stocks in the space are hovering right around that rising 50-day moving average and we'll see if it holds. I don't really know if it holds or not. I mean, if we see an absolute washout in the broad market, well, the spot price is remaining flat. We don't have any super bullish news flow. We're probably going down with it. You know, yeah. I mean, that's that's always a concern. You know, uranium mining stocks are still stocks. 
And, uh, you know, when there's some sort of liquidity event, you sell what you own, but that's been very difficult to predict. You know, people, people have been calling for a stock market crash. Let's see, uh, this entire time. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, is it coming tomorrow, next month or next year? I have no freaking clue. Is it coming at all? I also don't know. I also don't know. But, you know, there's plenty of reasons to believe that the stock market should be going down and probably will. So, you know, barring barring that, uh, you know, this this could, could just be a small healthy correction before the next leg. And we are in a typical strong season for uranium. Usually that has to do with nuclear utilities attending multiple conferences. And there's one coming up next week in uh, North Carolina, the, the NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute is hosting a international uranium fuel seminar and all of the nuclear utilities um, in the US and the Western world, especially, and I'm sure internationally as well, will be attending this conference. And um, so we'll see what comes out of that and whether or not that will lead to more purchasing in the in the uranium market. And we'll see some more uh, price appreciation. But yeah, the, the price is heading higher. I can't tell you if it's going to head higher this afternoon or or next week necessarily, but on balance, we're going to keep going higher and higher in the spot price. And generally speaking, we believe the utilities will follow that trajectory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay. You can close that. And then uh, we got a question on SPUT. So the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is uh, basically uh, Sprott Asset Management has uh, had the foresight to buy up a lot of this physical uranium that that came onto the market. And so if we're, it's bought up about a third of the annual demand for the planet a year, right? So uh, they got 62.2 million pounds of this stuff sitting in a warehouse unavailable to the utilities. And uh, Mike's question is, uh, does Sput applying for some sort of redemption mechanism change their odds of getting a New York Stock Exchange listing if they are successful? Um, it possibly could change the odds, but uh, management is saying that they're not reapplying for that. So um, that's not, I think that I've seen some rumors being bandied about on Twitter that that to my knowledge is not in the cards. I, I think that was the lack of a redemption mechanism was one of the primary reasons that they were rejected for the NYSE listing, but um, I don't see them going for it at this point uh, for, for various reasons. But um, no, the redemption mechanism, and it's also, as far as I understand, they haven't even necessarily applied for that redemption mechanism. I don't know necessarily what they're waiting for on that, but hopefully they do. And hopefully it is approved because I think it, it makes a lot of sense for this particular vehicle. But um, no, no, as far as we know, no plans for NYSE for, for SPUT. Okay. So far we haven't needed it. Uh, no. So. <laughs> no. Um, all right. Uh, can you bring up the, uh, the, the chart comparing URNM to SPUT? And that should uh, tailor nice into uh, Calif from France, his question. Uh, he said, uh, could you see a scenario in the uranium space like the gold sector when physical gold performed, but the miners did not? Um, so we're comparing basically uh, a group of the uh, uranium uh, miners, URNM, to uh, the physical uranium, the, the fuel that you use to, uh, to provide uh, uh, to the nuclear power plants. And you can literally see which one is performing better. You know, are the miners performing, outperforming the metal or is the metal outperforming the miners? Yeah, this, this chart actually is, is quite skewed by the big move that we've had in the metal over the past six to eight weeks because the miners went up pretty pretty substantially as well, but they didn't necessarily drastically outperform the metal. In fact, they pulled back over the past, let's see, two and a half weeks or so. And if you go back to the beginning of the bull market, which was you know December, 2020, right, right back here, you know, we're not far off of those valuations in terms of the miners relative to the metal. So this big move here, this happened um, with the metal not moving that much. The miners really took off December 2020 for three or four months with the metal barely moving. So are we going to see this type of move again? I don't know. I'm actually skeptical. Um, this I would this kind of move is what I'm sort of foreseeing is sort of higher highs, higher lows. And I think that we could do, you know, some kind of sinusoidal wave type move like this. 
but I don't think we're going to see drastic, drastic outperformance of the miners versus the metal. I just, I just don't. And I think the reason for that is uh, the backdrop of the broad equities space. I think that right now on the cusp of World War III, God forbid, um, you know, just the, the bond market doing what the bond market's doing. Um, you know, it's just kind of messy. And, and I think that there's still a decent amount of investor fatigue and investor fear, just generally speaking. So unfortunately, that's just where we're at. Do I think stocks still catch a bid and we go materially higher from here? Absolutely. Are they going to outperform the metal? I do think that they will. Are they going to drastically outperform the metal and go up like a hockey stick? Probably not. Uh, that's just my personal prediction, but either way, it doesn't really matter. I mean, this, this chart could move completely horizontally. We can still make a, a shitload of money. Yeah. So, um, cause the, the metal is going way higher and that's something that we have a very high confidence in, but as far as the alpha provided by the miners, it's probably going to be more, uh, individual stock based than just the broad miner space would, would be my guess until okay. and unless we have, a different, more robust, bullish equities, broad equities outlook. And honestly, it's it's hard to see that happening here, all things considered with recession on the horizon and election year next year. Um, I actually think that we could see a lot of geopolitical um, upheaval, you know, globally and in the US in the next 12 months. So who knows what that means for equities markets? Uh, but either way, we're, I mean, we're obviously long, we're not bearish on uranium stocks, but you know, uh, it's, it's, I think it's worth potentially keeping some cash and possibly hedging the market and shorting the market as a hedge. But, uh, but yeah, uh, looking at relative valuations, these stocks are still very cheap compared to the metal. Yeah. Okay. And the, and the basic way uh, to read this is when you, oh, I'm pointing at the monitor, like you guys can see my finger, uh, is when, when it's going up on this graph, that's saying that the miners are outperforming the, the metal. And mm -hmm. when it's going down, it's saying that the metal is uh, outperforming the miners. So that kind of gives you an idea of uh, well, what do I want to bet on? Do I want to bet on the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust because I think that'll outperform the miners that are pulling this stuff out of the ground? Or do I want to bet on um, uh, the miners because I think they'll outperform the commodity itself? Right. And you can see, I mean, this move from, you know, the summertime until the peak recently was on a relative basis compared to the metal, only about a 20% move, but the stocks were up, you know, 50 to 100%. Yeah, depending on the stock. So you still make more money. We didn't see a hundred percent move in the in the metal, and and certain certain equities went up at least that much during that period of time. So you're still going to get some some outperformance, some alpha with the miners versus the metal. I think the overall equities backdrop has a large influence on that. Um, but still, you know, owning some positioning in the physical metal itself, obviously, you know, like in the spot vehicle gives you a very liquid vehicle with no individual minor risk. It's great. Uh, I mean, everybody that's invested in the space, if you're looking for a stable, highly liquid position, you just want to play the commodity, you know, Bob's your uncle. But if you're looking for alpha, you know, you have to be good at stock picking and, and be able to stomach in crazy volatility. But in, in the long run, I would say, you know, my bearishness on, geopolitics recession and potential broad work broad market swoons is not a very super long-term outlook necessarily so i'm thinking about this investment for you know a two to four year period possibly longer uh, during which period of time i absolutely believe the miners are going to outperform the metal yeah yeah okay awesome all right we can take that one down and then um let's see joan wants to know what do you think would happen if all the financial players came into the market at the same time, long-term contracts are being signed? Do you think they are waiting for a catalyst to jump in or is there something else they're waiting for? Well, we're seeing a little bit, um, you know, Sprott was able to buy a little bit of uranium this past month or so. The Zuri Invest vehicle that launched in June, I think that they didn't, didn't raise as much as they had hoped, but they're definitely looking at trying to get access to the uh, to the North American markets as well. But they've been a buyer in low volumes on the margin. I think they were helped to put in kind of a floor in July and August in the spot market. Individual hedge funds, I know for a fact, are still buying uranium in smaller volumes. 
that are not uh, not just buying trust units of of sput, but actually physically buying uranium. That's still happening. And then, of course, we have Yellow Cake that did uh, execute on their option to buy from Kazatom Prom this year. They raised, I am forgetting off the top of my head, 125 million, I think. Um, so they'll be buying from Kazatom Prom. And then we have this other vehicle, PFYN, that's being launched out of Singapore that has the former uh, COO of Kazatom Prom, Askar Badarbaev, as a um, strategist for this vehicle. That's launching any day now. So all these vehicles are there. But why is money not pouring into them? Well, it probably has to do with what we were just talking about, just general sort of uh, risk off kind of capital concerns, I would say, are are affecting the relatively tepid money flows into the physical uranium trusts and, and funds. So will that change? Probably. Um, when? I don't know. What happens if that capital flows in at the same time that utilities are buying? Well, I think it's pretty obvious we're going to see a a more robust move in the price. Yeah. Okay. All right. The next questions here have to do with Kazatom Prom. Uh, so Kazatom Prom is the biggest uranium miner on the planet. Uh, the second biggest is uh, Cameco. Kazatom Prom is located in Kazakhstan. Cameco is located in um, uh, Canada. Uh, maybe just give us a couple minutes on the overview of uh, Kazatom Prom. You kind of hit a little bit on it at the beginning of the show. Uh, and and give us the the macro on that, and then we can kind of get into the questions. Sure, yeah, because Adam Prom is is by far the largest uranium producer in Kazakhstan. Generally, between because Adam Prom and all of their joint venture partners produces just under half of the world's uranium on an annual basis. Like last year, I think it was 44 percent of the world's U three hundred eight mining production came from a single country. Uh, I mean, that for a commodities investor is just pure gold, especially a country in uh, Central Asia that shares land borders with Russia and China. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> can you ask for anything more? Like the primary supplier of uranium is in an in incredibly risky jurisdiction. So th this country ramped production incredibly from the mid 2000s into the 2000s, incredibly. They went from producing a few million pounds a year to producing 60, I think they maxed out at about 64, 65 million pounds in 2016, which happened to coincide with the bottom for the commodity. Uh, big coincidence there. Um, prior to going partially public, which they did so in 2018, they were entirely state owned and they were they were producing hand over fist. Um, my gut feeling is that had a lot of influence from Russia because the coincidence of Kazatomprom or Kazakhstan ramping production during the mid 2000s effectively killed the global market for uranium mining. It, it put every other country's uranium mining um, under a thumbtack and they they just couldn't couldn't operate in such a low price environment. So is it easy to draw a direct line was between Putin and the death of the entire global uranium mining industry? No, it's not. But, you know, you can read between the lines. Uh, so massive, massive ramping. They also had a, a very extremely depreciating national currency, the Kazakh Tenge. And so they would uh, pay for their production costs in Tenge and sell in US dollars. So they had this incredible currency arbitrage. And even though the price dropped to you know below 20 bucks a pound, they still were making a lot of money, right? Because of that arbitrage. Well, fast forward to now, they are 25%, I believe, uh, publicly listed starting in 2018. They have had a quote unquote value over volume model. They pay a big dividend. They make a ton of cash. From an investment standpoint, it is the obvious value play in the sector. Hands down, nothing comes close. But, and there's a big but here, they have uh, a jurisdictional discount applied to them. Now that hasn't been that drastic because they're still held by the ETFs and ETF flows move the stock. That's why you saw the stock move the way it did in the past six weeks. But um, they are in, because Adam Prom specifically, they're making increasing ties to both Russia and China. And that's something that I think has pretty big implications for the Western uranium market, Western nuclear utilities. And in our opinion, it's more than likely that the bulk of the pounds being mined in that country are going to stay in the East. So there's been shipping 
challenges to go through the port of St. Petersburg in Russia. Typically, they will send uranium, mined uranium by rail to St. Petersburg and then out by, by cargo ship to transfer to the Western world. That's been somewhat problematic. They have tried to address this by establishing a Western route coming from Kazakhstan, going through the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. They call it the Caspian Route. Um, this costs 20x what it costs to go through the port of St. Petersburg. And it goes across a number of countries that are literally currently in hot conflict. So it's not it's not a good solution. So the temporary solution has been and could continue to be swaps, which is the Chinese have uranium stored all over the world, and uh, it's very easy to deliver to China and then swap. But that's also a problem because a number of nuclear utilities actually care about origin risk. And even though U-308 is fungible, it still has a, a, a value chain applied to it. So you can still you, you know exactly where uranium is coming from at all times. It's not like oil. Barrel of oil is a barrel of oil. Um, so Chinese origin uranium. Um, some utilities might request that that is not uh, that they're not buying a swap from China. So it's not a long-term solution. But uh, to wrap this up into some sort of cohesive point, it's a massive producer of uranium. They have the uh, incredible resources in ground. They are the lowest cost producer. They can ramp production easier than other jurisdictions, not only just because of the geology, but actually where they're operating. And they will increase their production. But thus far, we are not seeing the capex spend necessary to increase production because there's a there's a lag time between well filled development uh, capital expenditure and increases in production. We're not seeing that yet, and this lag effect is about twelve months uh, to see that actual production. The drilling of wells to when you get into production is about twelve months, and it's about eighteen months till that production actually peaks from that set of 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 uh, injection and recovery wells. And they have to constantly, constantly be drilling these things out. Uh, and so I'm actually even skeptical they're going to hit their more tepid production increase forecast for next year. I think they'll increase a little bit over 2023, but a 20 million pound increase by 2025, they're not going to hit that. One last point with that production increase is that a lot of that increase is coming from a couple of new deposits that are joint ventures with the French and with the Russians. So they established a new joint venture back in December with Rosatom at the Budinovskoy six and seven blocks. And this is a very large deposit and half of that uranium is going to Russia. Um, there's been whispers about potentially that Russia is not going to be selling uranium via third party sales agreements. Uh, that all of their uranium production is going to feed into their export business. And if that is the case, that's a big shakeup in the industry. So, and then the French are short uranium. So, and then because Adam Prom is going to be primarily selling to China. So, this big production increase that has everybody spooked, fade it. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I think that answered a lot of those. Uh, talked about Russia. Um, okay. Vano wants to know about uh, basically because Adam Prom's. Uh, management and leadership going forward. We've had an amazing turnstile of, uh, of you know, uh, CEOs and, and leadership going in and out of this company. What, uh, you know, you talk about risks. Uh, what, what, what do you see with that? Well, it, it doesn't really give you, you know, the warm and fuzzies. I, I think <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't lead to uh, a, a feeling that all is well, basically, I think is the easy takeaway from that. I know that a lot of the shakeup that happened in the last 12 months happened because of their dealings with Russia, their establishment of a new joint venture with Russia. And uh, currently, actually today, as we are talking, actually, it's probably um, midnight as we're talking we're in this particular case, but Putin and Xi and Tokayev, which is the, the president or prime, prime minister, I think president of Kazakhstan, they all physically met today. Um, probably to discuss energy politics more than anything. And uranium is a small piece of that. It's mostly oil, but um, it still it still matters. So I actually think that Kazakhstan and Kazatoprom specifically didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. Uh, but either way, a lot of the C-suite upper management decided to walk after that latest deal. And um, the new uh, the new management that's there 
I believe was also with the company during the days when they were having uh, much larger influence from Russia and ramping production like crazy. So we'll see. We'll see how long they last and and what happens there. But you know what? The only thing you can really do is look at their quarterly and and semi annual and annual reports and look at their capex well development spend. That's going to tell you what the production is going to be. And thus far, we're not seeing sufficient spend to to ramp production. Second half of this year, if we see their annual report, I think that'll be in February of next year. If they really ramped up well field development capex in H2 of this year, then maybe we'll see towards the tail end of 2024 a little bit of production increase. But it's not easy. I mean, it's it's easier than an underground mine in waterlogged Athabasca Basin to increase production, right, in Kazakhstan. But it's still not easy. It takes an enormous amount of money, an enormous amount of skilled labor, an enormous amount of sulfuric acid. They're building their own sulfuric acid plant, but that's not going to be online really full production until 2026. So, yeah, it's uh, we'll see, we'll see what, what management can pull off, but we're skeptical about the uh, successful ramping. Okay. Uh, okay, a couple questions on Mongolia. I'm going to try to tie them together here from Alan and Frank. Um, uh, so can you go over, uh, basically, uh, France just signed a deal uh, with Mongolia uh, for uranium starting in uh, 2028, I believe. And, um, you know, we've got the political risk in Niger, which was kind of a big supplier for, uh, for France. Uh, how do you see, see that deal going? Are they basically uh, just trying to trade political risk, Niger, for supply chain risk, Mongolia, or what? What? Uh, what do you see there? Well, I think the Mongolia deposit has um, ha- has good geology and has a lot of potential for production. It's it's tough to tell at this point how quickly that'll come online. This is a deposit that was discovered more than twenty years ago, um, and so now they're just kind of trying to finally get it happening. Obviously, it's uh, you know also between Russia and China. So who knows what sort of influence that can have on this particular situation over time. But yeah, first production expected late decade. Uh, you mentioned 2028. Um, that's probably pretty optimistic, but hey, it's possible. Even their pilot project produced about half of what they were expecting in terms of overall total volume of uranium. But you know, it's it's necessary. I mean, we need these new projects. We need them. It's not like any new supply is bearish. It's absolutely necessary to have uranium production come online because the existing projects have decline rates. You know, phase one of Cigar Lake is done in 2028. And will they go into phase two? That remains to be seen. The company tells us that they will. Uh, but it's generally understood that phase two is, you know, look, you go for the nose. You, you high grade in any deposit of any mineral, period. You go for the thickest, best highest grade stuff, whether that's an oil deposit, whether it's copper, silver, gold, uranium, you hit that first. So phase two is phase two for a reason. It's lower grade ore, it's possibly more difficult mining. Um, And the company will tell you that that's just the next step and all as well, but it's going to be higher cost no matter what. And, And there's no guarantee that it happens smoothly. So we have to have these projects coming online. Uh, but yes, Mongolia, um, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Narf has a question on Niger. Um, maybe you can just give us a quick update on yeah. uh, what we know out in uh, uh, Africa and Niger. Sure. Yeah. So, so the French are actually pulling out of the country. They're pulling their military out. They're pulling their. Um, uh, they're not pulling. Arano is not pulling out of the country. So I think that's that's important to understand that as of yet, Arano is still operating in the country. However, it's still very difficult right now to get material in or out of the country. So temporarily, production is probably pretty problematic. But as of now, we're not hearing anything in terms of Arano actually leaving Niger. And they've been there for 50 years uh, or longer than that, actually. So um, update in the country. It's, it's, it's dire for the citizens of Niger. I mean, it never was good, but now with the U.S. State Department declaring it officially as a coup, they're cutting off a number of elements of the uh, financial and otherwise support that the United States has been giving the country. So it's going to get worse for for the citizenry. The good thing, I guess, if there's a silver lining to that, is it's probably going to force the hand of the junta that's currently in power, and hopefully they can 
get their act together and and get a, a, a democratic election happening in the country here. But of course, you know, this is again, this is supply risk. You know, Niger is what five or six, seven percent of global uranium production. It's not huge, but it's about twenty to twenty-five percent of the uranium uh, going into the EU. It's yeah. vitally important for France. So it's one more thing. You know, Cigar and MacArthur not hitting production targets. Niger coup. It's like, yeah, no shit, they're going to Mongolia. Like they're they're going to try to get something else going there. In addition to making inroads in Uzbekistan and and this new deposit, the South Tort Kaduk, which is the uh, the French joint venture with Kazadam problem. So yeah, they're looking to expand production, but they got problems with their, with their legacy production. Okay. And the reason France keeps coming up is because the, the, a large load of their base load power is nuclear, uh, or their electricity is, uh, uh, the vast majority of it is, is nuclear. Do you know what yeah. that percentage is? Is it? It's like 70% of their overall, overall electricity grid. Yeah. Wow. They're, they're the largest electricity exporter in the world. Wow. Um, that's cool. That's cool. Well, they're ahead of the game. Um, okay. Uh, Wilson wants to know, any comments on global laser enrichment? That one is, you know, it's a little bit of a black box and for possibly obvious reasons because of the um, the proliferation concerns about this sort of technology. It's very difficult to get direct answers from anybody involved with these projects about timelines about uh about costs and things like that but there's a couple of um lois or mous signed with u.s nuclear utilities with gle uh and silex which and, and which silex technology gle is partially owned by cameco it's speculated that cameco is likely to increase their ownership in this in gle at some point but uh yeah i mean it looks promising i think uh whether or not it comes online at their stated timelines is still yet to be seen. I don't know. I mean, we're looking, I think at what, like the equivalent of four or 5 million pounds of U3 equivalent UF6 production from, um, from tails material at Paducah, Kentucky, I think starting in 2026 or seven. So that's, it's something, you know, I mean, we, we could use it. They would be definitely helpful. I think that there's other, uh, there's, there's other various, you know, the laser type, technologies and isotope related technologies for enriching uranium that are very exciting and I think possibly could be the future of enrichment, but uh, hard to hang your hat on it in the short term. Okay. All right. And Michael wants to know, how do you convince the greenies that nuclear is the path to energy independence? That's a losing battle, wouldn't you say? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I think to make some really broad stereotypes here, the, the greenies are, are generally, I think, people that are very concerned about climate and global warming or quote unquote climate change. And the primary driver of that concern is carbon emissions. So I think if you can just show very clearly that nuclear is the lowest carbon emitting electricity source. And it is, if you're looking at total life cycle uh, for the production of the electricity producing element, that's nuclear versus solar versus wind, it's lower than all of it. So if that's their primary concern and they look at everything that they do in life through a carbon lens, then they should be embracing nuclear. Um, that's, that's the best I can do. I mean, there's, how else are you going to convince them? Show them the data. Show them that show them that it's incredibly safe and it's safer than anything else and it's lower carbon than anything else. The data is out there and it's very clear. Yeah. Yeah. We asked Doomberg about that and he said, whenever you engage in those debates, you always lose. And 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 the engineers at these uh uh, nuclear utilities uh, just keep making it safer. Another nine, another nine, another, like how many nines do you have to go out before? And, and, and you'll just never win that, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And I, you know, I get into conversations all the time just with friends or, you know, dinner parties or whatever it might be. And when I, they ask, so what is it you do? Uh, <laughs> and I, and I start to tell them and they're like, wow, for, they're really intrigued and confused. And then uh, we start talking about nuclear and, you know, you know, it, it's obviously, you could say that I'm just talking my book, but you know, most of the time it's, it's always the same questions. It's what if about Chernobyl? What if Chernobyl happens again? Or what about the, uh, the, the tritium laced water that's being released in Japan? 
And of course, what about the waste? And it's like, okay, well, the the world's uninformed populace thinks the waste is a huge problem. The industry um, highlights the waste as as one of the biggest benefits of nuclear. Um, that we have such a tiny amount of waste produced by that by this uh, phenomenal energy source. Yeah, yeah. Hit them with but- facts and 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 release attachment to the outcome. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. We're getting short on time here, so we'll wrap it up. Uh, I get this question uh, every time, uh, you know, I do the submit questions for Justin Hewn. And I think it comes from when I went to the VRIC and I interviewed uh, Warren Irwin. And, uh, you know, you're, you're regular on the show here. Uh, can, can you ask, uh, will, will you do a panel discussion uh, with Warren Irwin and Justin Hewn? The, the uranium investment community needs to see this in order to discuss if there are pounds of uranium that we're going to stop. Like, uh, would you be open to doing a, a, a panel like that if I could get it uh, get it up? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I like Warren. I and I'm I have no problem whatsoever with his takes. Uh, you know, I I disagree with his belief that billions of pounds of uranium will come flooding in at X or Y X Y Z price. Um, you know, he's primarily highlighting, it seems like he's primarily highlighting <clears throat> inventory numbers and global inventory numbers. You know, there's north of a billion pounds of inventory, but who is holding it and why matters, you know? Yeah. So China's holding most of that, right? China's holding probably, I would say a third to a half of global nuclear, of global uranium inventories. Wow. Uh, yeah. And probably, probably more like a third you know, let's just call it 400 million pounds of uranium. But all you have to do is look at the reactors they have operating, the reactors under construction, even if they don't hit their targets of 150 gigawatts by 2030. And they probably won't. They'll probably hit 120 or something. Uh, But the annual consumption out of 120 gigawatts is about 65 million pounds of uranium a year. And if you think China is going to flood with sales into the market, uranium that's going to last them, you know, six or seven years of inventory, uh, you're, you've got something else coming. So um, it's also, you know, Warren Irwin, like, just leave him alone, you guys. <laughs> I mean, just let it's OK for people to have a take that's opposite yours. Uh, it, it really is. And it's also, you know, he's he's become like a scapegoat for for a bearish concern that many people have had over the years. Like at 18 bucks a pound, people thought the market would get flooded at 30. And at 30 bucks a pound, they were sure it would happen at 45. And at 45 bucks a pound, they were it was guaranteed to happen at 60. Well, now we're at 70 and the market is tighter than it's ever been. Ever. Not just since I've been watching it. We have never seen a $15 uranium spot price move on uh, very, very low volume trading. There is no uranium that is flooding the market right now. And we are at higher, the price has quadrupled since 2016. And you're telling me that, uh, exactly when is this uranium going to come into the market? So let people have their takes. Just look at the evidence yourself, you know, do, do a little bit of homework and and you're not going to be concerned about that sort of statement. And by the way, some uranium will get sold into the market at higher prices. But as of yet, the evidence of that happening has been the opposite. The market has gotten tighter, not more liquid. So I don't really see why strategic inventories would be sold into the market unless and until those inventories can be readily replaced with with supply that's coming online at or below prices that they could sell it at now, right? That's the big, that's the big kicker with this is like, if you look at the reverse carry trade, when Sput was buying hand over fist, why did we see pounds coming held in carry being sold to Sprott? Because they could cover. They could cover at lower prices. And that was a moment in time. And that's not happening again, because we've got seven, eight percent interest rates. Um, because we have, uh, you know, the cost of capital is huge. And the market is so thin that nobody's going to sell inventory if they can't cover off. And if you can't cover off, that, that strategic inventory isn't coming into the market. Are some Japanese utilities sitting on a little bit of uranium that they bought at $80 a pound, they want off their books at at least break even? Sure. Is it going to kill the market? No, I, I don't believe that it will. But you know, only time will tell. And yeah, I'd be happy to talk with Warren, but I just, for the record, I have no adversarial feeling towards him whatsoever. 
So, and, you know, he made a very wise investment in next gen when they first kind of started to hit pay dirt, that's worked out really well for him. And, and, you know, he's a uranium bull, but he just has an expectation of, of pounds hitting the market at a certain price point. And as far as I can tell, based on our research, I see zero evidence of that whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. Why would China sell their inventory at 70 bucks a pound when they feel just like we do that it's probably going to be 80 six months from now or whenever? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And, and China doesn't have uranium. So they've got the Husab mine in Namibia. They've got Rossing. They have a 20% stake in fission if that ever comes out of the ground. Uh, and they've got joint ventures in Kazakhstan. That's China's uranium. So those inventories are very, very valuable to China. That's not to say they won't trade a little bit here, a little bit there, but um, you know, they've been tiny spot market sellers in the last few years. And this year they stopped and they've been buying uranium in the spot market. The Chinese entities have. So nice. Yeah. Nice. Good. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Justin. If uh, people want to follow you and your work, um, there will be a link down in the show notes. Can you just uh, give us a couple minutes on what they can expect uh, if they sign up for your newsletter? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we can be found at uraniuminsider.com. Um, we focus heavily on the physical market more than anything. So we want to know exactly what's going on in the spot market and the term market, because that tells us where we can expect prices to go. So that's that's the bulk of our work. We have a, a very wide net of industry contacts at this point, and we, we stay on the pulse of this market and we express what we learn from our research and from our industry contacts into what it means to you as an investor. And that's what our members receive. So they get monthly newsletters that are 40 plus pages. They get timely email bulletins when there's a market moving uh, piece of news, whether that's company specific or sector specific. Um, I do almost daily video updates for members only where I talk about the market action or any news that came through that's important to, to get across to our membership. And so far, we've outperformed uh, the benchmark pretty significantly. So since we started this in August of 2019, we're up about 370%. And URA, for example, is up, including dividends, about 160%. So we've more than 2x the benchmark ETF. We're pretty proud of that. And you know, we, we think this market has a lot of legs here. There's We're still far away from incentive price for greenfield projects. And and the supply that's supposed to come online in the next few years is going to be insufficient to, to balance that deficit. And we're in year one of a contracting cycle and we expect to go for multiple years. So very excited here. Uh, yes, are we in inning one and it's a super contrarian bet? No. Is this super de-risked? Absolutely. We still have a lot of money on the table here. So yeah, yeah. looking forward to the coming years for this trade. So are we, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, there will be a link down in the show notes for Justin's website. If you're going to sign up, it's an affiliate link. Justin's been nice enough to kick a little bit back to the show. It's a win-win. Support the show. Hit the like and subscribe and share this with you. anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy who can't stop talking about NVIDIA and Tesla. You have yourself a great rest of the day and we will talk to you next time.